Good morning. Welcome to Cagayan Gospel Church Online Worship Service. We're happy that you could join us this morning. Here are our announcements. If you are interested to be baptized and you have questions about baptism, we would like to invite you to join our baptismal classes which will open in the coming days. Please feel free to call our church office on the following numbers posted on your screen regarding to baptismal classes. We thank God for another school year and the youth ministry is asking for your prayers as they will start online care group. Pray for the leaders that they may grow in their intimacy with God and reach out to the youth with passion and joy. Let us now pause for a moment and prepare our hearts as we worship the Lord and listen to His Word. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 135, 1-3. Psalm 135, 1-3. Please read aloud with me as I read our call to worship. Praise the Lord! Praise the name of the Lord! Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to His name, for it is pleasant. Let us pray. Our Almighty God, we give you praises. We want to honor you. We want to worship you this morning. And Lord, we ask you that you would use the songs that have been prepared for us this morning to be able to facilitate our hearts. Our voices will be lifted up to honor you and to worship you. Lord, we ask you that you fill our houses with praise, with thanksgiving among our family members, among ourselves, and among, among our loved ones. Lord, we ask you that you fill our houses with your glorious presence. Father, receive our praises, our worship, and may you alone be glorified. And that this morning, Father, we ask you, come before you, that you would ready our hearts to receive your word. May our hearts be as empty, like an empty cup willing to be filled once again with your promises, with your truth, and with your goodness for each one of us. We commit to you our speaker, we commit to you our, our family, our time this morning. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, let us ready our hearts and sing praises and worship to our God.
is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Just a part I'm lifting up my air 
everything Well, it's all I have to offer And it's all I have to give Two hands and one heart One life to offer you Two hands and one heart That's what I give to you Use me today Use me today, I know you can, Lord, I surrender to your plan. Well, you made this heart, and you made these hands, take me and use me as I am. Well, it's all I have to offer, and it's all. Good morning, everyone. Two Sundays ago, if you are following our English online worship service, we talked about Mark chapter 1, 12 to 13, and there we get to see that Jesus overcame temptations using the scriptures. And very interestingly, how God would remind us last Wednesday in our Zoom prayer meeting, um, the speaker also talked about the G uh, temptation of Jesus Christ, and it was a wonderful reminder for us how we could overcome, no? how, what, how God would provide for our needs, how God would protect us, and how God would grant us power as we serve Him, especially in the area of uh, missions. This morning, we look at our passage, and here we get to see that John the Baptist is now arrested, and he is now in, arrested and he is in prison. And about that time, Jesus was already starting His ministry. He was proclaiming the gospel, preaching the gospel. And so, Jesus' baptism, His temptation, and now He started His ministry preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the good news. If you have your Bibles with you, I would like to invite you to open to Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. And if, or you could also read uh, with me through the, using the screens. Please read aloud and allow God to bless you, just even by the reading of His word. Mark chapter 1, 14 to 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net 
into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who are in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. May God bless us as we have read his word. Let's start with a prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Father, Lord, we thank you for being so faithful, being so good to each one of us. We thank you for allowing us to become part of your family, to be your children. And this morning, as we come before you in your word, grant us the needed concentration and focus. Help us, Lord, to be open to your teachings. Uh, empower your servant. Uh, speak even, Lord, to our kids and to our family members so that uh, we will be in one in learning uh, from your word, we will be one in honoring you. We will be one in exalting your name, Lord, because you are faithful. You are good. Bless each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to look at the resounding call to the gospel message and the call to discipleship. And what should be our response to this, a scene in the response of the pioneering disciples. Now, let me encourage you. There might be a lot of things here this morning, but I don't want you to get lost in all these things. This is the main thing, responding to the call of God, the call to salvation, and along with that, also with that, the call to discipleship. I don't want you to miss on that main point. How should we respond to God's call to each one of us? So let's look at our passage and see how Mark described the gospel message that Jesus preached. Two things about this uh, resounding call to the gospel of gospel message. Two things about the gospel message. Mark chapter 1 verse 50, 15. Jesus was proclaiming, preaching the gospel that the time is fulfilled. Now, what is fulfilled? The time is fulfilled for what? What time is it? For the coming of Christ, God's Messiah. It was time for the salvation of man to come upon the world scene. Allow me to mention two things that were meant by the time is fulfilled or the fullness of time. First one, world and religious events were ready for the coming of Christ. I don't know if you'd remember Pastor Dr. Keith Ching. He mentioned about this during his last visit last February of 2019. And he mentioned a few things which is very similar. Number one, that the law, that the law had done its educational work. What does it mean? It had shown through the Jewish nation that men are terrible transgressors. Despite all of God's favor and God's blessings, man still failed to worship God in love. The world now had a picture of a depraved heart of man. The world was full of people spiritually starved. The worship of self, of pleasure, of other gods, small g gods, of philosophical ethics which left many empty and barren. Remember the Grecian philosophy? Remember Aristotle, Plato? Remember all these things. Remember the uh, the pursuit of pleasure, uh, the Stoics, remember all this uh, philosophy, the soul, because of all these things, the soul was now ready to have its hunger met. The depravity of mankind at that time, from slavery to temple prostitutions to baby sacrifices to death in Colise coliseums, gladiator, co gladiator contest. And all other immorality, plus the deception of many deities and small g gods at that time. The gods of many empires, down from the Persians, the Grecian gods, the Roman gods, and even the god wannabe Roman emperors. All this depravity, it's ripe for the preaching of the gospel. The time is fulfilled. There was also a sense of the peace. There was also the idea of the peace under the Roman rule. The world was an open door for the spread of the gospel without any restraint. During our social studies, Asian history, a world history, you get to hear about the word Pax Romana, where there's uh, somehow a great peace during the Roman Empire because they are in, they're in control of almost all parts of the world, the world during the time. And because of that peace, there's enough uh, commerce happening, there's enough activities happening where uh, good, good for the gospel uh, to be spread. The world, at that time, the world spoke Greek as a basic language, and this made communication possible with many from all over the world. Historians say, historians say that though the Romans overthrew the Greeks and ruled with military power, 
but the Greeks retained their influence and impact even during the Roman Empire using their culture, their language, and their political system. Number five, the world has this had a system of roads for mass travel. This allowed Christian missionaries to reach the farthest parts of the earth. It also brought commercial travelers to big cities where Christian believers were concentrated and their gospels, uh, the gospel is preached. People get to know about the, the Jewish uh, God and, and all these uh, possibilities because of the road uh, systems. Look at Galatians 4. Uh, verse 4 to 6 it says but when the fullness of the time had come the fullness of time had come God sent forth his son born of woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and because you are sons God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba father first Timothy 2 5 to 6 for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Secondly, I said from time is fulfilled, the fullness of time means, no, secondly, the fullness of time means that the prophetic events were ready for the coming of Christ. The first one, world and religious events were ripe, were ready. The second one, prophetic events is now being fulfilled for the coming of Christ. God had foretold that Elijah must come first and prepare the way for the Messiah. Isaiah 43, Malachi 3, 1 says that. So Elijah came in the person of John the Baptist and now John the Baptist's ministry is passing from the scene. His ministry of preparing for the way of the Messiah is done. And so now the time for the Messiah to appear in force, proclaiming the glorious gospel of God's kingdom. Now, no two significant relevance here to our lives. Two observations, two applications if you will. Number one, God prepared the way for His Son by moving world events. He controlled history and events, and He controls all events and circumstances for the sake of His people. And God can do that. God can do that to our situation now. Number two, second, God fulfilled His promise. Fulfilled His promise to prepare the way for His Son. He will fulfill His promises to believers. He prepares the way for every genuine believer running ahead of the believer to take care of him and so whatever situation you are in right now whether you have health concerns you are frontliners right now or whether your business is affected by the pandemic or the quarantine or whether you have difficulty adjusting in online classes or you have trouble budgeting your things because of all the difficulties of all what's happening in our city in our nation remember God is in control of all these things God is gonna prepare for his people it may not be easy at this moment, it may be difficult, it may be challenging, but rest assured that God is preparing something better, something wonderful for His people. And rest in His promises, rest in the idea that God is in control. Be fully convinced, Romans 4.21, fully convinced that God was able to do what He had promised. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Now second, Mark chapter 1 verse 15. Aside from proclaiming that the time is fulfilled, Jesus also proclaimed in His resounding call that the kingdom of God is at hand. Now what is this kingdom of God? Sometimes biblical, uh, biblical authors, biblical scholars, Bible scholars would use kingdom of heaven to refer uh, to the same thing, to the similar thing. There is really much to say about the kingdom of God and each item, a sermon or a devotional material can be drawn up from them. For now, let us just have an overview of what is the kingdom of God. First, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that is at hand. It is present right now. Matthew 12, 28 declares this, but if I, Jesus said this, but if I, Jesus, drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it's already here. Spirit, that spiritual kingdom is already here. It has already come. Number Secondly, the present kingdom refers to God's rule and reign and authority in our lives as His people. And even, and I believe, even among the unbelievers, as God can, in His infinite wisdom, has His purposes for their disobedience and rebellion. 
Look at Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. It's a long verse, but look at this very beautiful passage. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and, um, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, huh? not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Colossians 1.13 He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. This kingdom is here right now, reigning in the hearts of the believers. Number three, the present kingdom is offered to the world and to men in the person of Jesus Christ. We can enter, we can, we can be part of God's kingdom through the person of Jesus Christ. Number four, the present kingdom must be received as a little child. We're very familiar with this verse. Jesus says, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these in Mark chapter 10, 14 to 15. Number five, the present kingdom is experienced only by the new birth. We need to have that, we need to experience that rebirth. John chapter 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, you need to be born again, that new birth. John 3, 3, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Number six, the present kingdom is a spiritual life-changing blessing. Let me emphasize that part, life-changing blessing. So when we experience the kingdom of God, it's spiritual, it's a... And, and it, it spills even to our physical lives because, because of the transformation, because of that experiencing, that life-changing blessing, it even spills to our physical lives, our, our physical selves. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So just imagine when you have so much joy, when you have so much peace, see how well your sleep will be how good your relationship would be uh with, how good your relationship will be with your family with your friends with your loved ones with those you are you're working with your colleagues imagine a life full of peace joy and righteousness it does indeed uh spill over to the physical things of this world number seven the present kingdom is to be the first thing that we ought to pursue we ought to seek as believers matthew 6 33 but seek first the kingdom of God kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you brothers and sisters the kingdom of God is already here but there is more yet to come it's already here but there is more yet more to come there is that consummation that fulfillment the, the final completion of the kingdom of God when he returns when Jesus Christ returns as a triumphant king and bring us to be with His presence for the rest of our lives. And so with Jesus' resounding call to the gospel, mankind must respond. Verse 15 tells us how we ought to respond. And we ought to respond by repenting and believing in the gospel. Both is essential. Or repenting from our sinful self and believing in Jesus Christ. We believe in the gospel, we believe in the person of Jesus Christ. Both are essential. Repentance and belief are essential. Repentance by itself does not satisfy the law which was formerly broken. A person may repent and change from his former life, but repentance is not enough. All our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. They're like filthy rags in the, in the eyes of God, Isaiah 64, 6. Payment and satisfaction must be made for the laws he has already broken. And this is why a person must believe in the good news about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly. He lived a sinless life. He was perfectly righteous. And as such, he perfectly or he fully satisfied God's wrath. He stood as the perfect man, the ideal man, the pattern of what every man should be. And as the ideal man, he could stand for every man and offer himself to God as the ideal payment, the ideal satisfaction for all 
who had broken the law of God. And so this is the glorious gospel, the good news preached by Jesus Christ throughout Galilee. I'm sure the disciples have heard him preach, not just for the first time, but many times they have heard him preach. And the person who becomes acceptable to God is the person who repents and believes in the gospel, who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the ideal man who has made the perfect payment the perfect satisfaction for our sins. Jesus Christ is the atonement for our sins. Now, if repentance is not enough without belief, so it is with belief only without repentance. The two should always go together. Repentance and repentance and belief, they need they should go uh, they always go together. Faith by itself does not satisfy the law. Faith without repentance, without a true change of life is insincere. It is profession only. It is just by mouth. It presumes upon God, thinking He will excuse a self-centered li life and just hide our sins away under the rug or turn a blind eye on our wickedness. Faith in Christ, in, God, in Jesus' satisfaction for our sin, and repentance are both essential to enter the kingdom of God. Faith in Jesus Christ, a genuine faith in Christ as one Savior and Master, should, should and would, natu or would naturally result to a life that is constantly progressing to becoming more like Christ, repenting from sinful ways and turning to God and Christ-likeness. Faith in Jesus Christ and repentance from our old sinful way is not to be separated. They should go hand in hand. If you have not yet made a decision to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and pursued to live a repentant life, brothers and sisters, my friends, now is the time. The time is near and God is calling you to be a part of His family. I pray you would respond affirmatively to God's call I know God has nothing but beautiful purposes for you. Even if it may come as persecutions, even if challenges may come your way, even if may, it may involve following a lot of commands, a lot of rules, a lot of biblical uh, uh, statutes, even finding ourselves in situations like the quarantine right now, God ultimately has beautiful purposes for those who belong to Him. And so I pray that you would repent and believe in Jesus Christ and respond to His resounding call back to Himself. Let us continue and see how the disciples responded to this call and learn from them. Responding to the resounding call of discipleship, verses 16 to 20. Now before we go there, let us first consider the kind of people Jesus called to be part of His pioneering discipleship. Here we get to see that Jesus called simple men. Take note, they were not religious leaders, they were not powerful men, they were not the political leaders of that time, they were not part of the uh, ruling body, the nation's ruling body, the Sanhedrin, or they are not part of the priestly or ministerial uh, people. They are also not students in the schools of higher learning. Very simply, they were ordinary men, simple laymen engaged in the affairs of life, just like all the laymen of their day. Now, having said this, however, a question needs to be asked. If these men were just ordinary people, why did Jesus call them instead of calling the more gifted? The answer lies in some very special qualities that the disciples possessed. They did have some very special qualities that made them stand out from the average layman. And this passage gives us a picture of these qualities, a picture of the kind of person that Jesus calls. What are their qualities? The first one, in chapter 1, verse 16, we get to see that these people were casting their nets into the sea. And so, these people that Jesus called were industrious and hardworking men. Jesus saw Simon and Andrew casting a net into the sea, and a little farther up the lake, he saw James and John, his brother, mending their nets in verse 19. Jesus has no use for the lazy, for the slow-moving, for the sloppy, for the nonchalant, for the, dis, for the disinterested, for the uncommitted workman. The person who Jesus calls is an industrious, hard-working person. A study of God's call to various 
people throughout the scripture will make this fact a little bit more clear. For example, compare the call of Amos. Amos 7, 14 to 15, Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The call of Elijah, 1 Kings 19, 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of, uh, the son of Shaphat who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, passing the baton to Elisha and bringing Elisha into the ministry. And compare what, the, what Saul of Tarsus said, who was uh, now the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, and he, he, we could see here he was nothing. He was never... Uh, he was... Never anything uh, but lazy. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and the following says, Therefore, uh, 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Apostle Paul was encouraging the people, the people of Corinthians at this time, and he was having that attitude as well. For sure he was having that attitude. And so why is this so? Why is this the way God, that Jesus called the disciples? Because attitude for God, for Jesus Christ, attitude is more important than status, riches, and human knowledge. Aside from hardworking, Jesus called visionary men. Visionary in a sense that they were not settled for the status quo, but was constantly on the lookout for the Messiah. Their vision was set on meeting the Messiah and they were ready to follow Him, no matter the cost. Of verses 17 to 18, the disciples of Jesus were visionary men. They were looking for the Messiah and ready to follow Him. This was the quality that distinguished the disciples from many others. Some laypersons possess the other qualities of the disciples, as they do in every generation. But this next one, this particular quality, was found in few, if in any other man. And this next quality, which is actually also their response to Jesus' call to discipleship, is the quality of their willingness to sacrifice everything in order to follow Christ. Many were looking for the Messiah, but few were actually ready to follow Him. Few, if any others, would pay the cost of giving up their businesses and immediately following Jesus. But these men were willing to follow Jesus, and they did follow Him. Now, few people would have a strong vision, a vision so strong that they are willing to pay any price to follow Jesus Christ. For many, giving up their profession or business, their home or environment, family or friends is just too costly. They lack the vision. But a few who has this vision are willing to follow Jesus no matter what is the cost. Jesus calls a person to a life of hard work, to a life of work, not a life of ease and comfort, not a life not a life of uh, convenience. Jesus calls a person to invest his life, not to waste his life. Look at this verse. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Luke chapter 9, 23 to 24. Another observation, another thing that we need to note is that the primary call for the disciples here is to become fishers of men. They were not primary, primarily called to become teachers, not to be preachers, not counselors, not administrators, not builders, not fundraisers, nor anything else. Yet how easily we obscure and camouflage the evangelistic ministry of the church by losing focus on what is the main calling that God has for each one of us. The Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission doesn't require you to be professional teachers, 
to be just classroom teachers, when we become disciple makers, when we become ma- fishers of men, what Jesus Christ wants us to do is, while we are going, while we are working, while we are growing, while raising up our kids, while we are studying, while we are pursuing higher education, find ways to make disciples of those people around you. Teaching them, teach them using your lives, teach them how you pray, teach them how you read the Bible, teach them everything that I have commanded you. I have commanded you to be grateful, I have commanded you to sing, to worship, to honor my name, I have commanded you to be righteous, I have commanded you to be generous, I have taught you to be kind, to be compassionate. Just teach these things to those around you. And that is discipleship, that is making disciples that is teaching them, that is training them, that is giving them opportunity already to know more about Jesus Christ through your life. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That is the primary call. That is our primary call. Together with Jesus Christ, seeking those who are lost, preaching the gospel to them that they may be saved through faith by grace in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we are called to be God's witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And 2 Timothy 2 chapter, chapter 2 verses 2 to 3, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. These are the kind of people Jesus called in the pioneering work of the ministry. And so how did they respond to the call to discipleship? They responded in obedience. They followed Jesus Christ. They followed Him despite what it involves. You can see that in verses 18 and, and verse 18 and 20. Zebedee and his sons, James and John, they were successful businessmen. But take note here, the sons left their father with the hired servants. And perhaps this is the reason why John was able to enter the place of the high priest when Jesus was being tried for treason in John 18, 15 following. He probably would have provided fish for the palace or they would have enough uh, to be able to uh, get the favor to come a little bit closer when Jesus Christ were tortured or was flogged. Now, take note of some significant things here of uh, what the passage says. James and John despite their success as, fe- as fellow laborers with their father, as fellow fishermen with their father, they sacrificed their part of the business. They were either present owners already or they would be future owners by inheritance. But they gave it all up to follow Jesus Christ. These two was a rare quality found in few persons. Many of us are heirs and future heirs of our parents' successes. But at the same time, James and John were considerate of their father. They didn't just leave him alone, and they would have never done that. They cared for him, and that's why they left their fathers with some people to help them, hired servants. A question, a question for ourselves, a question for many of us. How many of us would sacrifice our inheritance to follow Jesus Christ? The Bible says, Matthew 6, 21, for, your, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Brothers and sisters, friends, the disciples responded in obedience to the resounding call to discipleship. How about us? God calls us to, a self, to, to the gospel message. And more than that, God also calls us to discipleship. How are we to respond? The disciples did not just hear Jesus preach for the first time here in verses 16 to 20. They would have heard Jesus Christ preaching in the region of Galilee. And the more they hear Jesus Christ, they have responded to the gospel message and wanted to follow Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ was zeroing in, was targeting, focusing on them, and wanting to call them into this ministry of discipleship, into this ministry of the gospel, to be part of this pioneering work, they responded. How about you and me? How are we going to respond to God's call for us? In the 11th century, King Henry III of Bavaria grew tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch. He made application to Prior Richard at the local monastery, asking to be accepted 
as a contemplative and spend the rest of his life in the monastery. Your Majesty, said Prior Richard, do you understand that the pledge here is one of obedience? That would be hard because you have been a king. I understand, said Henry. The rest of my life will be obedient to you as Christ leads you. Then I will tell you what to do, said Prior Richard. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. And when King Henry died, a statement was written, The king learned to rule by being obedient. When we tire of our roles and responsibilities, it helps to remember God has planted us in a certain place and told us to be a good accountant or teacher or mother or father. Christ expects us to be faithful where He puts us. And when He returns, we'll rule together with Him. Jesus was in Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, proclaiming the message of the good news for His people. We ought to repent and believe in the gospel. The disciples were called and they responded in obedience, leaving their profession and business in order to follow Jesus Christ. Some of us will receive a special calling to drop everything and follow Jesus Christ and serve Him in a full-time capacity. Some others will not be called with this special calling. No matter what the case, I hope you will respond to God's call in your heart as the disciples responded. For those who are praying and being led to full-time ministries. There are challenges up ahead and expected difficulties, but the joys cannot compare to these things. And for many of you who is called to follow Jesus Christ as parents, as wives, as husbands, fathers, mothers, employees or employers, as children and grandchildren, as grandparents, as doctors and nurses, teachers, businessmen, drivers, homemakers, as seniors, as students, Whatever stage or whatever role you have in your life now, God is also calling you to repent and believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. God is calling you to follow His Son because in His Son, there is life. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is nothing that we can do. While others are wishing for the church to somehow grow, let us go fishing. Let us prepare ourselves to be instruments of God in church growth and be fishers of men. Let me close with the six items that talks about what we are called from and called to be. And I hope that you will be encouraged of the beauty of the calling that God has for us. Number one, God has called us from labor to rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. God called us from death to life, 1 John three fourteen. God called us from bondage to liberty, Galatians 5.13. God, God, God called us out of darkness and into light, 1 Peter 2.9. God called us from bondage to peace, 1 Corinthians 7.15. And God called us to the fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.9. And by obeying that call, we are made sons of God. John 1 12. We are made children of God, Galatians 3 26. We are made the servants of God, Matthew 25 21. We are made God's saints, Colossians 1 2. By obeying the call, we are made God's witnesses, 1 Thessalonians 2 10, 2, 10 and again Acts 1 8. By obeying the call, we are made workers together with God, 2 Corinthians 6 1. By obeying the call, we are called to a high calling, Philippians 3, 14. We are called to a holy, holy calling, 2 Timothy 1, 9. We are called to a heavenly calling, Hebrews 3, 1. Brothers and sisters, my friends, God is calling you and me from where we are to be part of His kingdom and make us fishers of men. How will you respond? Ponder upon this truth. I pray that your response will bring joy to your heart and to your family members. God bless and have a wonderful morning. Thank you.
times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble, I can still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond.
sermon, we would like to take this opportunity to express God's extravagant love for you and me. But we can never fully experience His love and grace unless Christ's redeeming power is at work in our life. God revealed in His Word the Bible that man is sinful, and whatever man does, he can never please God. So, he can never save himself, but God has given us His provision, a way by which man can be saved, that is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ's death on the cross became the greatest sacrifice for man to attain salvation, that by believing in Him, everyone can receive the hope of being with God for eternity. If it is your desire to make Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, receive His love and forgiveness today, and accept the eternal gift of salvation, you can follow through and make this as your personal prayer right where you are now. The words of this prayer are not mystical chants to receive God's salvation. Rather, the words of this prayer are essential only when it is prayed heartily to God, asking Him for forgiveness. You may pray this prayer. Dear God, I need you and I am humbly calling out to you. I am tired of doing things my way. Take control of my life as my Lord and Savior. Fill the emptiness in me with your Holy Spirit and make me whole. Lord, help me to trust you, love you, and live for you. Help me to understand and fully experience your grace, mercy, and peace. Thank you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you have made this prayer today, please contact the numbers posted on the screen so that we can follow up on you and help you on your new journey in Christ. Thank you and God bless. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.